Thank you. We're going to jump into uh, chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, not covering all of those today, but we'll be covering a lot of ground, so we'll jump right in. And we talked about forming a new community as we're part of this. Just a reminder that Connie sneaks in uh, after everybody's in place and, and hands out a study guide that has the answers on it. Some of you picked that up last time. Did, did people read it, some of you? It's not a test or anything, but did, did, you, get it? did you look at it? Yeah, well, it's available again, and, and so uh, it'll probably be no more helpful than last week's was, but uh, if, it, if you do find it helpful, great. You can certainly pick one up and take it home with you. Because, let's be honest, the Bible is complicated, and, and, and these questions are hard. We're struggling with hard things and trying to make sense of them, so take it home if that would be helpful for you. Let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll read that together. Loving God, even as the gloom of rejection spreads over your son, he gathers a new community around himself. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of that community and to follow Jesus on the way to the cross. Help us to be faithful. Open our minds and hearts as we listen for your word of life. In Jesus' name, amen. At your tables, why don't you take a moment and make sure you know everybody there, so never to say your name. And then, where are we at in the story of Matthew? How far can you get? Uh, so spend a couple, three minutes talking about that at your table. Mostly they read them because of the unusual spelling. I have retained a list of Wayne's. There are 20, there's only 34 spellings of Wayne that I have. <laughs> only one right. I read it all the Maybe we'll change it. Is that right? Yeah. Interesting. He's always, he's always going back and saying, this is what happened, and here, is, here it is now. Here's what, here's what it said here. Now here is Jesus fulfilling it. Um, so there's an awful lot of that. He uses Mark. Mark, Mark is written earlier. And then I still go to church. So all of Mark is in man. Well, okay, he's going to ask. So he's talking to the Jews, he's also talking to his disciples. He's giving away. Right, 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 yeah. 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 Getting them going through on getting the job training and getting the job training. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a good word. OJT. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a lot of tension there because you can just feel it in the gospel between the old and the new, trying to bring the Jews along. And uh, obviously, splitting families. It's a very hard time. We're starting to see it. Let me call you back. Oh, yeah. This working now? Yeah. Let me call you back. Shelly preached last Sunday. So, I haven't had any chance to write anything on the whiteboard yet today, and I kind of get a little edgy if I haven't done that. So, tell me some things I can write on the whiteboard. Tell me about Matthew. Where are we in the story? He's been baptized. He's been baptized. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> Jesus has been baptized. Okay, we've, we've got that substantiated. What else? Relationship with John. 
relationship with John was important. And not always neat and tidy, was it? No. no. John was kind of discouraged uh, about the direction. Well, James? I think he's feeling rejection, and he sort of changes his strategy. This is Jesus now, right? He's yes. feeling some rejection, all right? And, and it's funny because all we can do is read... Uh, read let me just work on my spelling here. Rejection. <laughs> Um, all we can do is read in things. The biblical writers aren't very interested in psychology. Uh, they're not. They're, they're, but we read things in. We do. We, and I think that's natural as human beings. Yeah. So you think he's changing his strategy. Say some more about that. Well, I, I think it surprised him when people didn't get it. And it surprised him when his own hometown didn't get it. And so now he's looking at the disciples and he's saying, you know, you're going to have to carry this on. Yeah. And it's sort of sort of like he's realizing, you're giving a lot of this away, but, but he's realizing he has to use the people who get it. Yeah, and okay. Yeah, well, we did say before, he's turning most of his attention now on his closest followers. Right. So he's turning his attention on the disciples. So, yeah, he is realizing that the crowds just don't get it. You know those Sunday morning crowds out there? <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the Bible study group by Thursday. They don't really get it. Um, oh, did that work? <laughs> On disciples, yeah, that's very true. We see it because that's where he's spending a lot of his time. Yep, very busy teaching. Very busy teaching. If you read the in-between chapters, and I'm sure you all did because you're all the faithful right to front it, um, you read all the parables in between last time. Well, you, know, you don't have time to cover everything, and if it was 28 weeks long, I'm not sure anybody would come. So we're just making it shorter and uh, skipping some things in the middle. But yeah, lots of teaching, lots of parables in the middle. Other things? It seems like he sent his disciples out um, independent of whether they individually had doubts or not. If you doubt or don't doubt, you still get out there. And yeah, doubters are welcome. Yeah, you know, it's nothing like going through a sermon series on faith and doubt to see where that word doubt pops up all over the place. I mean, it's in the story of the boat. You know, they're doubting in the boat. So doubters get to go too, which is good. Are there the infants? <laughs> Say it again. Are there the infants maybe that Jesus refers to? Like and there's and there's some infants which might refer to the little ones, which might say something about the makeup of the Christian community. Yeah, yeah it might be uh, disciples. I think there are greater disciples and lesser disciples. I hate to use that term. We wouldn't use that term. But there's some, some poor and lowly and ones on the on the margins that are welcome too. And yeah. just learning. Yeah. Those just learning. Yeah, absolutely. Other things? Clearly he stands out against or opposed to the then known religious community. His words offer life and hope um, versus what uh, the people are normally hearing from. Him. Okay, so he's got this antagonistic relationship going on and his words offer life and hope, at least as we're reading it, as as we for read us. It, as we read it. You notice we're not calling ourselves the first Pharisee Lutheran Church. <laughs> um, so, but at the time, and, and, and we don't say this very much, but the Pharisees were really the dominant power in Judaism. The temple was gone, so the Sadducees, who were the priestly class, a lot of those people have kind of gone by the wayside. But the Pharisees are around, they're the lay uh, teachers, for them the law and the living tradition is very important and very important especially when you don't have a temple around anymore so you have to adapt but the Pharisees and their group are over in the synagogue and, and Matthew and his church are not and so naturally they're going to be butting heads and naturally the story is going to point uh, or paint the Pharisees with a particular slant but I really think they're good people. They're trying to be good people. They're just not open to what God is doing, the new thing God is doing. Yeah. All right, let's 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 press onward. Thank you for that. You have been listening. Uh, that's great. It makes me feel good. <laughs> let's turn to Matthew 13. And we're going to start even before I said. We're going to start on verses uh, 51 through 53. Okay, 13, 51 through 53. I alluded to this a while ago, and uh, we'll see if you remember. Have you understood all this? That's Jesus talking. And they answered, yes. That would be the Thursday Bible study group. Yes, they said. 
And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he left that place. So who remembers what we said about that the very first day? Anybody? You get like an A plus if you remember this. This might be, let me give you a hint, this might be a fingerprint of Matthew right here. So if this is Matthew's fingerprint, who's Matthew? What's he doing in this story? What place does he have? He's a scribe. What's a scribe? Secretary. Like a, like a secretary, like a writer, but we, they used the term more specifically back then. An expert in the law. So the scribe is an expert in the law. And so, okay, so we got this new community. It's not going so well a lot of weeks. We're not sure if the Gentiles and Jews are getting along at all. And what, what we're supposed to be serving at the potluck. And, and how we're supposed to be honoring the Old Testament and in what kind of way. Okay, the world is changing. The culture is changing. I'm sure it felt like to, to good Jews that everything was kind of falling apart. What's this world coming to? And, and then here's Matthew saying, okay, you need a good scribe around to help you figure out what the law is telling you now. Now, Jesus has provided a lot of help for the Matthews of this world, the, the teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said in times of old, but now I say to you, I say to you. And Matthew is living out of that tradition. Uh, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who knows how to take out the treasures, what is old and what is new, and sort those things out and allow those treasures to continue to provide health and well-being and teaching for the church. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that's who Matthew is. At least a lot of scholars do. I didn't make this up. This is what a lot of scholars think, and it, it makes a lot of sense. It's that tension between the old and new that you run into throughout this gospel. It's not as simple as just taking something from the Old Testament and saying, this applies exactly to life today. No, Matthew's that scholar who's going to help them figure out how it applies to life today, and he's going to take his lead from Jesus for a lot of this. Okay. Go on to question number two, about Jesus' reception in his hometown. I'm going to read this out loud. Um, Jane was alluding to it, but he came to his hometown and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And not, are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and are not all his sisters with us? Notice the sisters don't have any names. Uh, the sisters with us too. What then did this man get all this? Or where did, did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their <coughs> unbelief. What did the reception of Jesus in his hometown tell you about the people of Nazareth? Why don't you talk about that at your table for a couple minutes, okay? It says they're normal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. no never. Matthew's community. Before you do that, let me tell you a story, okay? My dad served 20 years at Rosita Lutheran Church at St. Peter Lutheran Church in rural Beersford, South Dakota. And uh, it was a good place. That was my formative, uh, my formative years. And uh, I had uh, since gone on to college and then seminary and became a pastor. My dad retired. Uh, they were looking for their first pastor in 20-some years. So it was kind of a shock. And... Um, and, and I remember hearing through the grapevine that one woman that will remain nameless, well, <laughs> Eddie Sobio. Um, <laughs> Eddie Sobio, uh, I don't know what she had to guess be, but when they were collecting names, she goes, whatever we do, I don't want to have Bert Christopherson's name put in here. <laughs> and I was like, what did I ever do to Eddie Sobio? I have no idea. But uh, obviously my reputation preceded me. And... Uh, my name never got put in there, not that I really wanted to go there anyway, but uh, 
uh, I remember feeling a little of the pinch of a prophet not being accepted in his own town. So just don't call that Bert Christopherson, whatever you do. So I'm still stinging about it. You can tell. Still stings. <laughs> tell me about Jesus and what he felt that day. I already know, but you tell me now. What do you think? They expected him to be a carpenter. They expected him? Yeah, why not? Be a carpenter. He certainly didn't fit the pattern, did he? No. What else? Well, if, he comes, if they hear about miracles or see him doing miracles, how, they have to be very skeptical about how in the world could that happen. Yeah, he's just one of us. Yeah. He's just one of us. I mean, they were astounded, he said, but... But they're astounded in one verse, and by the next word, the next verse, they're almost offended, aren't they? He says, Joseph's son and Mary, they live right around the corner. How could this possibly happen? If they were Norwegians, they'd say showing off. Yeah, that's true. Right. <laughs> making a scene in public. So people have been, been to Minneapolis, and they've heard, they've heard the, the, the play. And, and isn't there a part of us, and we do this with the Bible too, that God can work on Mount Sinai? But really, God's going to work right down the street. Mm -hmm. God's going to part the waters of the Red Sea, but God's going to be involved in this church in a real and present way today, really, through Don Butters? <laughs> <laughs> really? I think yeah. they expected <laughs> bigger things. Say it again. They expected bigger things. They certainly could. You know? Especially if, if they were whispering that he's the Messiah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why, you know, if God were working here, we'd expect big things. Yeah. <laughs> Something right out of heaven. Yeah. Just, yeah. That, that could have been some of that going on, too. Like we talked about last week with John the Baptist. Yeah. I think it's a typical small town reaction. Isn't it, though? Because I know I came from a small town, and there's some people that are very well-known, and you think, gee, I knew him back there. You know, <laughs> How could that be? And you kind of have to know your place in a small yeah, town. Yeah. yeah, you don't want to get too big for your britches. You just don't. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't Jesus do some more works of power there? Why? Yeah, good question. What do you think? They wouldn't believe him anyway. Because... Yeah, that could be. Wouldn't you know, believe it anyway. I, you know, you can look at it as he was punishing them for their disbelief, but I almost think it was harder for him to summon up these powers if he was surrounded by people who weren't supportive. You know what I mean? I mean? At least I like to think that's part of it. That he needs for people to, you know, it's an interactive thing, healing someone and, and the community. So that because of their unbelief, he maybe didn't feel as powerful. I may be making him very human here. But yeah. That's, that's an interesting yeah. theory. I wonder, too, you know, in Matthew, and we'll see this theme especially next uh, two weeks from now when it comes to the parables, Advent parables, sometimes People in Matthew get exactly what they want, and that's and that's not very much sometimes. You know, I, I don't I don't believe that God would do that. I don't think God acts in that way. And guess what? We don't see it, and God doesn't. You know, he, sometimes we get what we're expecting. You know what it's like sometimes. If you're in a good mood, you tend to find happy people, and if you're not in such a good mood, you tend to find crazy people. You know, it just, it just, life works that way. So, not that there's any of those people here, but you know, in other churches. I got lost in the Bible. I was in Mark accidentally. Uh -huh. I know that this story is not in Mark. Uh, about, about him being back in Nazareth. Okay. Yeah. It is in Luke, I know. Uh, but, but why isn't it there? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Good question. Well, I'm looking at Matthew as a person. Yeah, I don't know. It's a great question, Dwayne. I don't know. I'd have to do a little thinking in terms of the flow of the story and, yeah, good question. All right, let's go on. Question number three. I'm going to read that part first and then we'll read the text. The story of the feeding of the multitude occurs in all four Gospels. Uh, a clue that it was an important memory for the early church. The story is an expression of the old and the new in the kingdom of heaven. There's that phrase again. In terms of the old, the account of the desert feeding would have reminded the reader of Old Testament feeding stories such as Exodus 16, man in the wilderness. In terms of the new, the story would have connected them to the church's experience of being fed at the Lord's Supper. Notice the four verbs, taking bread, blessing bread, breaking bread, and giving bread. 
Let's, uh, let's read those verses right now, and um, we'll follow up on that. 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew, and that was the part about John the Baptist losing his head. Sad story, we won't take the time to read it, but certainly a sad story. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. There's that introspective side that Jay has been looking for. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who were, and those who ate with them were five thousand men, besides women and children. So imagine that you're sitting in Matthew's congregation and you're hearing this story. What does it have to say to you about the life in the church and maybe your own life too? Take a few minutes at your table and talk about that. Church. You hear this story? Tell me about it. Or our church for that matter. Mm -hmm. Lots of hungry people. Lots of hungry people. A variety of hungers aren't there. Yeah. But certainly physical hungers. Other things. Well, I thought of Jesus. Um, he had just heard about John, John's death. And he wanted he wanted some time away, like Pastor Nick said, for grieving. And then here's all these people and how he, you know, put his feelings aside and met their needs. Yeah. The need is pressing and urgent. Yeah. Yeah. Well we said the you know said lots of things actually but but the one that I liked was uh, the community was important he could feel that these people were having a good time together and he didn't want to break them apart okay and so then we got onto this question of worry you know the disciples are worrying about having enough to feed feed and I think it was Carla who mm -hmm. said that sometimes people drop in you unexpectedly and you're like oh I don't have <coughs> the food I don't have all the yeah. and, and it's always enough because it's more about being together mm -hmm. and being in company and community than it is about the food. Mm -hmm. And so we worry about the wrong things. Yeah, we do. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've got, and we talked about that a little bit in our team, one of the things that I've got from this, is whenever I hear this story, um, is I think the, the message here that Jesus is giving to the disciples, to his followers, is that, you know, uh, first off, the first thing we want to do is if the problem, if the issue seems too great, we don't want to deal with it. Send it away. We just can't. It's too big for us. Too much to comprehend. Yeah, but, but Jesus is saying, you can do great things with what you have. You do not need to have a whole lot, whether it be money or, or gifts or whatever. You can do something. You can do great things with what you have. Nice. Just take a step in faith. Yeah. I mean, you think, you think very many churches sit around and say, we have so much on a regular basis, we have so many people and so much money and so many resources, oh, we'll just have to give some of it away. I mean, usually churches are kind of living on the edge, aren't they? It's like, are, do we have enough people? Do we have enough folks that we can line up for this project? Do we have enough money that we can scrape together for this project? And and, and we, we feel like we're, we're that hungry multitude. We're the ones that need to be fed, and we are fed. We are fed at that communion table, and we are welcome to that. And it's a meal of extravagance. But I'm not sure we always feel as readily uh, uh, available to share our resources with the world. And a story like this reminds me that we do have enough, just like you're saying, Wayne. We, we have enough to 
to go and share, and God can multiply out of God's goodness, and amazing things can happen. Really can. Yeah. So I think I think this is a story of the church from the beginning of time. We're kind of that small community meeting at somebody's home and wondering. We're just kind of hanging on, wondering if we have enough. And and Matthew says, and Jesus says through Matthew, yes, you do. You have enough. I want you to go, and I will bless what you are going to do. You give them something to eat, and you can. I would think that there would be people sitting there in that crowd saying, is this Moses? I'm sure. Is this Moses? Yeah. This is amazing. This is man in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, we've only heard stories about this. Um, but is this Moses? Because it sure seems to be. Yeah. Thank you, God. This Good. is a super large congregation. And Matthew plays with numbers a lot. With 5,000, with 12 left over, there's a lot going on. Yeah, there, there are. There are. And in Mark, it is another feeding story in Mark, and there's 4,000, I think, and there's seven baskets left over. I mean, uh, which is a number of completeness. Matthew has that same story, too, but he doesn't say it's to the Gentiles. Mark has a, that second feeding story be specifically to the Gentiles. Um, Matthew's more ambiguous about that. But yes, yeah, there's, there's going to be more showing up and more people, and I think the numbers are significant. Let's go on. Question number four. On the surface, Matthew 14, 23 through 33 is a story about the disciples traveling across the Sea of Galilee in rough water and on Jesus' ability to walk on the sea. In a deeper sense, Matthew has shaped this story into a parable about the church and a discloser about the nature of Jesus. Remember, more and more conflict, Jesus is retreating, spending more and more time with his disciples and talking about the church, painting a picture of the church. And so, especially this and the, the previous one, uh, you get that sense of, of what that might mean for a future of the church. So let's read those verses too. After Jesus dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but then by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, but the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. He said, Come. Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. So much like the last story, paint a picture of the church and its challenges based on this story. I'll give you a couple minutes to talk about that. So tell me about this picture of the church. Well, I was mentioning that uh, the Danish Lutheran tradition has a wonderful uh, tradition of having a ship usually hanging somewhere in the sanctuary. You know, I've heard that. I've heard that story. And, uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and I've been in so many churches, but a lot of churches, if you get into that church and you look up, and the ribs and the ceiling, the way the architecture is, if you just turn it over, you're in a ship. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and I think that uh, when Jesus is in the boat, it's calm, you're strengthened, you're there, but you do have to get out of the boat. Yeah, you, you do. You do have to get out of the boat. You can't just stay in the boat. But it's nice there. Yes, it is. Very comfortable. We like each other most of the time. Yeah. Other things. Paint a picture of the church. Well, we're like Peter, we said here. That's why you get mad at Peter. I mean, it's like he says, I want to walk on the water too. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh -huh. I mean, and then he can't believe it. Yeah. And he needs Jesus to bring him. He, <laughs> wants, he wants to participate, and something happens, doesn't it? He's, 
He looks around. He sees the wind. Yeah. At that point, he has a divided mind, doesn't he? Is it Jesus or the wind and the waves? <laughs> and I think the wind and the waves went out for a while, and then he starts to sink. We know what that divided mind can be like, don't we? Yeah. What else? What else about this story hits home? Reminder that the church will have significant challenges. It's not going to be all smooth sailing. Be I think so. Faith and strong, and then faith is weak. I think so. We, we, we don't have smooth sailing. Uh, we figured that one out since the beginning of the the, uh, the beginning of the church uh, in Acts. Uh, there's always been issues. There's always been waves that have been battering the church. There always there's always been storms that the church has been facing. Absolutely. Yeah, so I think in a very real way we can live into the to the metaphorical aspects of this story and say we've been there, we've we've been in that boat, and sometimes it's calm, but a lot of times it's not calm. Yeah. Sandy was asking a question: Why does he walk on the water? As opposed to like flying above it or something? Or? Well, you know, well, that, you know, that's the question: Is uh, he was really reaching out to them? Yeah, he and, was. You know, if you say there's something mystical about the story, you can have the parallel that God sometimes has to reach pretty far or do something really amazing to try to get to us because yeah, we're far does. away. Nice, nice point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's interesting because you could take this a little further too and say that the disciples are only in the boat uh, because Jesus invites them into the boat. You know, somehow there's the, the, Jesus told them to get into the boat, I think, early in the story. Um, and then, and, and Peter only comes to him because Jesus said, come. You know, the, there's that role Jesus is playing here in the church that makes it bigger than a, a bowling league or a social club. And Jesus is an authoritative presence and voice in this story that you don't see in some of the other stories in quite that way. I mean, you did in the last one where he's feeding the crowds and now he's stilling the storm and Jesus is taking on a role that maybe is going deeper, and they're, and they're seeing a deeper glimpse of who Jesus is in this. But they're certainly not a church on their own. And then, and then if you look at what Peter does, even if he doesn't do it very well, uh, it's kind of a glimpse into how Matthew understands discipleship. Peter obeys Jesus. He steps out. You want me to go where? You want me to try what? Uh, I, I think I was kidding, Lord. And, and, uh, but he does. He steps out of the boat. He obeys Jesus, and that's discipleship for Matthew. Uh, it isn't as simple as just looking things up in the Old Testament, though. It's it's listening for that voice of Jesus today and now, and 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 being responsive to that and stepping out. So the second part of that question is, what does this story tell us about Jesus? Tell me about Jesus in the story. In the rough times, Jesus is there to hold out his hand to help. Yeah, the rough times. He's there to help. No, notice some of the verse, verse twenty-six. They thought it was a ghost. He cried out in fear. Twenty-seven. I'm sorry, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, "Take heart. It is I." So, what's that? What's significant about that? Could rely on. It's the same thing in Exodus 3 when God says, I am. I am who I am. This is Jesus using God language now. I am. Remember that story? I am. Uh, this is Jesus. I am. That doesn't translate very well in English. I uh, never translated all that well when they were saying it either. But uh, you know, some, God is some form of the verb to be. Uh, in, in a literal grammatical kind of sense, but uh, in, in a theological sense, I am here. And that's how we get the name Yahweh. It's connected with that same verb, the root, the personal name for God in the Old Testament. So right at the very beginning, it's like, I'm here, I'm in control, I am. He's the only one that can really help. I, I, exactly right. And we have trouble recognizing him. Yep. Just Sometimes like we do. Yeah, we do. Absolutely. We don't We don't know who's coming to us, but I am here. Don't be afraid. And then what else does it say about Jesus? He asks the question, why did you doubt? Yeah. That's a significant question. It really is. Yeah. 
little faith and, and, and the subject of little faith and doubt are going to show up time and again from here on out in the gospel at critical times. Yeah. Yep. I mean, the part I like about the story is that one word, come. Yeah. That's that invitation to the disciples. You have such, come. Such a powerful statement. Yeah. Yeah. Let's unpack this a little bit further. Verse 28, Peter answered him, what do you call him? Lord. 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 Who's Lord? What's, what's a Lord? He's somebody that's out walking on the water, and he's got ruling power over these untamed powers of chaos uh, that are at work in this storm. And they, they don't use the word, well, they kind of, the root of the word, look at verse 30. But when they noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So in some way, we've got Lord, and now we've got Savior, somebody who reaches out to help a frightened, uh, flailing uh, disciple. And then finally, at the end, look at, look at what they did. Verse 33, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So he's not only I am, he's not only Lord, he's not only Savior, he is Son of God, one who is worthy of worship. Kind of an amazing amount of stuff written into this little story, isn't there? About life in the church and what the center of our life in the church needs to be as we're being buffeted by the storms that we face all the time in our world. Yeah, great little story. There's some other one, good ones coming up too when we press on. Verse, question five. As we noted several times throughout this Bible study, Matthew was writing to a congregation that was predominantly Jewish Christian. And on countless occasions, Matthew's church faced the problem of determining how much of what they formerly believed and practiced was to be continued in their new life of faith. This question became more and more complicated as an increasing number of Gentiles joined their congregation. I'm going to read just a few verses of this, not the whole passage. I'm sure you've read it at home, but... Chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. And he answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God? For the sake of your tradition. And on the conversation goes from there. So, for those of you that remember this well enough, um, summarize the argument, what's going on there about whether or not Jesus' disciples were breaking Jewish law by washing with hands that were not, that were not, or by eating with hands that were not washed. You wash your hands before you eat? Yeah. Every time? Yeah. Man, I don't. <laughs> I don't, but good for you. Good for you. If you go into a restaurant, do you immediately go to the restroom and wash your I don't, hands? I don't do that. I don't. You do? Just Way to go, Pat. Good for you. <laughs> You're following Old Testament law? No, no, no. no. <laughs> what? You do it because your mother told you to. No, just because of nursing. Yeah. You're a nurse. You're used to doing that. Yeah. yeah. Or you pull out your hand sanitizer. Yeah. That's things. true. Yeah. yeah, some people pull out their hand sanitizers. We we are told, especially in cold and flu season, to wash our hands regularly yeah. for about, what, 20, 30 seconds or something? <laughs> Nobody washes that long, do they? Yeah, wash it for 30, 30 seconds? <laughs> If I wash my hands, it's not quite that long, maybe 10. All the way through happy I use the hand sanitizer more than I wash my hands. I think it's a good So, what about these disciples not washing their hands? Ever been in a culture where you've seen, like, maybe Muslims uh, washing their feet, uh, ceremonial washing? So, we've, we've witnessed some of these things either in person or on TV. So, what about these disciples? I think the Pharisees are saying, well, they must not love God. They're not following the tradition of the elders. By whose authority? Well, that's going to be one of the issues here, isn't it? Who, who gets to decide? Yeah. The number one matter of conflict in the church, the one, number one cause of conflict in the church is control. Who gets to decide? It's an issue back then. It's still an issue to, to today. So, um, who gets to decide? They ask a question, and they're, notice where they're talking about this ceremonial washing. Where does it come from? Is it from the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
some of the tests did originally have to do too with just people came on dust covered roads. So there was a need for cleanliness, yeah, <coughs> dust covered roads. It's in the in the Old Testament, it does not say that you need to do this. That's why you notice that it's called the tradition of the elders. Uh, the Pharisees were the most progressive of any of the groups back then in terms of taking the law and applying it to new situations. The Sadducees, if you look at the Sadducees, they only accepted the first five books of the of, of the new Te or the Old Testament. That's it. If it didn't show up there, it's not it's not true. It's not of God. But the Pharisees accepted all the law and the prophets and the, and the writings, and they also had oral tradition, a living tradition as we try to live into a new day. So again, you, 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 have, to be, you have to be at least appreciative of their effort to, to continue to try to be a faithful people. Um, well, and wasn't it really important that the priests go through some sort of cleansing before they did, did the sacrifice or whatever it was? And they weren't supposed to touch a woman who was menstruating and all this stuff. So there's a whole bunch of old Jewish rules about cleanliness. Which, Absolutely. You know, you know, and, and, and I can just talk, talk a little bit about how you go from an Old Testament law that says the priests shall wash their hands for a variety of reasons, uh, ritual reasons, to everybody doing it. What would happen is that the priest would uh, wash their hands. That would be the first stage. But then some groups like the Pharisees would say, we need to apply that to a new day because we run into people, too, that are unclean. And so they would apply that in a living tradition. Perhaps we come in contact with a corpse or an unclean animal or forbidden food along the way. We're unclean. We should not sit down and eat that meal. And then, that's, so that's the first stage. In the second stage, you get people that are particularly zealous that want to apply that even more stringently. Let's, let's do it all the time, just in case. Because sometimes we don't know. We don't know if somebody's been unclean. We don't know if there's been a menstruating woman. Um, we don't know for sure, so just in case, everybody washes their hand. And then the third stage is gradually this hand washing gets applied and becomes the accepted practice for everyone all the time. And, and you've, you've done it so long you can't even remember where it came from. So that's how a living tradition develops. We've got all kinds of these traditions. We don't know where they came from, but we've got them. Um, a lot of them have to do with how we make lefsa. But, you know, there's other things too. You know, they're, they're very important traditions. And whether we eat brown sugar or white sugar on them, and whether they're warm or cold or butter or not, and, you know, on and on we go. Um, but this is, a, this is part of their tradition, the tradition of the elders. And, and notice how Jesus turns it around and he said, well, okay. I'll, I'll do you that, but let's turn this around and say, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? What's he talking about there? Do you remember when you read it? <coughs> yeah, honor your father and your mother, which sounds like a, a, a thing for little kids to do, um, to be respectful to their parents, but really in the day it's a way to provide for the well-being of elderly parents, make sure that they don't, they don't have to fend for themselves when they can't at their time of illness. There's no security system. And so they, they have basically sidestepped that actual commandment by saying, what we would have given to God, we're going to give to, well, the church building project or something. You know, just something religious. And Jesus said, you're not honoring the commandment that way, so what about that? And so the argument takes off from there. Who gets to decide, who gets to decide what the will of God really is in these situations? So that's the issue that's going on here. So it's complicated, but then they eventually get into the subject of what? What they're eating. What they're eating. You remember that? Things that defile, verses 10 and 11. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, listen and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. So what's that all about? It's quite a statement to make when you've been a good Jew all your life. It's not what you eat is what you say. Yeah, it's not what you eat is what you say. And but think about it. Think about it. every day, every meal, every moment. You wondered if you're mixing things together that you shouldn't. <laughs> of course, you you knew it so well you didn't have have to think about it. But. And now he says it doesn't matter. I don't know how we got away with that. 
really. I don't know how he got away with saying it doesn't matter. He didn't. He doesn't get away with it ultimately. What? No, he doesn't. Well, right. <laughs> You're right. I mean, he kind of does the same thing with the Sabbath. We saw it last week. He does some of the same thing with the Sabbath. It's like Jesus almost openly um, challenges these rituals and traditions. And he said, maybe this isn't the only way to be a faithful disciple um, at this time. But of course, he's pointing out how trivial those things are. And, and what his response is, is what you say is so much more important. You know, how you treat your parents is so much more important yeah. than, than all these rules that you that take up a lot of time. 613 of them. <laughs> and, they, and they really can feel pretty trivial sometimes. Of course, that's us as Gentiles looking at them I as understand. Jews thinking how trivial, but they're not trivial for them at all. It's their lifeblood. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with different Sabbath rules and and uh, people could make a really big deal out of some particular things that next door neighbors did. So I never felt trivial at the time, but maybe looking back. Well, I think Jesus is trying to change their perspective on it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to spend too much more time here, but it, it's very interesting. I think I, I think this text becomes some practical guidance for Matthew's church in the extent to which some of the old religious traditions and customs um, could be followed or not followed in a new setting. Remember, they're they're in this new setting with Gentiles, and they have to figure out a way forward in a new day. And so, some things like hand washing. Um, before the potluck dinner, don't necessarily all have to happen. Okay? It can be very practical like that. Okay, we're going to have a meal together. We can actually sit down. But you don't have to, all the Jews don't have to get up and wash their hands first to still be good Jews. And so I think that's the second part of that then is there is room in this, in this congregation of ours for Gentiles to be seated side by side with us. There's room. We have enough room at this time. We didn't think we had room before, but let's remember back to some of the things Jesus said regarding the Sabbath and regarding washing hands. And yeah, maybe it was more trivial than we thought. Hard as it is to admit that some days, we're going into this with eyes wide open to the new possibilities, this new thing God is doing in a church that has Gentiles in it too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think that's what's going on here. I don't want to spend too much more time on that, but I think that's what's going on. Complicated, but we see it at the end then. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. So, Pat, if you want to do that as a nurse, fine, but you don't have to do it as part of the living tradition of the elders. <laughs> you know? Letting you know. All right, let's move on, because we have an interesting story that's coming up. Okay, question six, Matthew 15, 1 through 20, and that it loosens the bonds of Jewish ritual and tradition is yet another anticipation of the mission of the Gentiles. And right on cue, it seems, a Gentile woman arrives on the scene. So 15, 21 through 20, uh, we're going to read through 20. Hmm. I'm in the wrong chapter, sorry. 21 through 28, sorry. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. That would be outside of Israel. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. And the encounter between Jesus and the Canaanite woman is situated in every way on the border the boundary between the old and the new, between Jew and Gentile, between male and female, between friend and enemy. What does this story tell you about the mission of Jesus? This is a hard story. I'm going to give you about two minutes to struggle with this, and then we'll talk some more, okay? Good luck with that.
So share me uh, some wisdom. Share with me some wisdom. Or anything. <laughs> he was rude to her initially. It sounds rude, doesn't it? We have to be very careful not to transport thoughts from the 21st century back to the first century. But yeah, because it sounds very rude. We'll unpack that a little bit, but that it, at first glance it feels rude. Well, a woman was persistent. She was very persistent, absolutely. <coughs> Jesus seems to like persistent people, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories in the Gospels where Jesus rewards and is amazed by people's persistence. Well, and, and he is capable of thinking again about what his mission is. Is that, you know, he said, I'm just supposed to be here to help the Jews in the house of Israel. And sort of like in the last week when he says, take this cup for me, he's beginning to realize that his mission is bigger than even he thought. Yeah, but, but how big, and I, you're hitting on something that's a very important part of the story, I think, Jane, in interpreting the story, is, is Jesus sent to everybody, or is he just sent to Israel? Hang on to that thought. Uh, we'll get there in, in just a second. What else? She calls him Lord. Calls him Lord, which could be a term of respect, like master, like Lord, like sir. It can be something as simple as sir, but it could be more. The son of David. The son of David, yep. Yeah. She she gets some sense of who he is, absolutely. Yeah. We said that he probably wished some of his Jewish people had as much faith in him as she appears. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. He's just coming from kind of an angry confrontation with official Judaism. And now, here he is uh, on, the, uh, on the edges of things. Um, and, 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 you know, it doesn't say this in the story, but the Canaanites were uh, Israel's ancient enemies. So you couldn't pick somebody you liked worse except maybe Samaritans. Um, they were half-breeds. Uh, I apologize for the language, but that's how they looked at them. You know. The so, disciples uh, get this thing started. They, yeah, they do. They, uh, they kind of fan the flames. <laughs> they, they really fan the flames. <laughs> you know, it says she spoke with a loud voice. The same word that they use for that is the same as shrieks or screams, which is the same word they use for women in labor. So imagine women in labor, and uh, then you, you start to get the idea of how the disciples oh, send her away, please. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you, you start to get a picture. Nothing wrong with women in labor. I know, don't, don't, don't get me wrong there, but that's kind of what you got going on there. This is a bothersome woman, and what are we going to do? Yeah. Well, he, he shows us in a, showing people an example. They, they want to get rid of her, but he's saying... No, you know, he ends up talking to her, showing people that we are going to accept women and go across the border. Yeah, he does go across that border eventually. I want to talk about four move. Oh, go ahead, Pat. I think it's interesting that she knelt before him. Hang on to that thought. That's a great point. Four movements to this story for those that are keeping track at home. <laughs> In the first movement, Jesus, or the woman, begs Jesus for mercy. He begs for mercy and you know, amazingly, Jesus meets her with what? Silence. Doesn't say a word. You know, one of the main themes is going to be in this story, she has great faith. But at first, Jesus doesn't respond at all. In the second movement, the disciples urge Jesus to get rid of this bothersome, clamorous woman. Now, it doesn't say whether they want her just to be dismissed or for Jesus to heal her so that she can go on her way. You know, provide the healing she wants, and then let her, let her go on her way. And then Pat, she does what? She no, kneels before him. Why is that significant? Yeah, I think she's sensing what he could do. Yeah. It's the same word that get used of the Magi, and the synagogue leader, and the disciples themselves in the boat. We just heard it two chapters or a chapter ago. This is an act of worship and reverence. This woman somehow picks up on that. Uh, maybe, maybe the word Lord means a lot more than sir in her mind. Yeah. Uh, third movement, she repeats her plea. Uh, and then Jesus' response comes across as kind of a rebuff almost. It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. 
And as much as that might try to get softened up by preachers sometimes, well, Jesus didn't really mean dogs. He meant puppy dogs. Um, well, no, that's that's one of the ways that it gets described in commentaries. And uh, it's, it's kind of probably a, a proverb of the day. Can't take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. It's, it's, it's a hard saying. Again, we don't want to impose 21st century standards on what's going on in the first century. So what's he saying there? What's he saying? What do you think? Who did Jesus come for? The house of Israel. The house of Israel. He is Israel's Messiah. Now, he just pretty much been rejected by Israel. Yeah. The Pharisees, the scribes, they don't want to have much to do with him at all. Uh, and so it would be really easy to say, okay, forget it then. If you're going to be that way, I'll just spend all my time with these people over here. These good Gentiles over here, because they're at least open. And so you could argue that this is one of those turning points, one of those temptation times for Jesus. Are you going to stick with the mission at hand, or are you going to drift over here to these people? Because they seem a lot more open than the Jews do. So I think it's one of those pivotal times. And I really think Matthew's theology is going to make this point. Jesus can only become the Savior of the whole world by first living into his role as the Messiah of Israel. You've got to be the Messiah of Israel first. He's not saying that to be mean. Uh, I, I really don't think that's going on. I think he's saying it because he's reaffirming to himself that he came first as this son of David, as this Messiah, and then only living through that, dying through that, rising through that, could he become the savior of the whole world someday. So I think that's what's going on in that third movement. And then finally, the resolution of the story, the fourth point. Um, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, which I think is also a response that captures the essence of Mark of Matthew's theology. Because Jesus is the obedient son of God, the Messiah of Israel, he will become then the savior of the whole world someday. Okay, so I think it, it, this story mirrors what's happening in Matthew's church. Think about it. Think about these Jews that had to give up almost everything they believed in and stood for in this church. It's not the same at all. We don't even know if we like it. And so the Gentiles come in, and what are they going to probably get at first? Silence. Silence. The same silence that Jesus showed to that woman. And then maybe after a while, they, they come to kind of an annoyed awareness of their presence, like those disciples. Well, I guess they're here. Maybe we can send them away. Maybe they'll get tired and leave after a while. But then where does it go? Ultimately, you'd like to think that it leads to an active Gentile mission. So I wonder if this story isn't one of those pivotal stories that leads us from I don't know if we like these people at all, too. Well, maybe there's room for him here, too. Yeah, there really is. There are full brothers and sisters in, in the faith. Okay? And then Jesus, you know, Jesus' story of this Canaanite woman get used to uh, tell some things between the, between the lines to Matthew's community at that time. Did that make sense? I know we covered a lot of ground there, but I, I really think some of that's going on. Is there significance to the fact that the daughter is healed and no, Jesus doesn't go, doesn't have any contact, doesn't put his hands on her, bless her, he just heals automatically? Yeah, good question. Sometimes. Maybe, maybe. I mean, the centurion's son was much the same way. I don't know. Uh, if I may, I kind of like the, like in this passage to the degree of uh, something that has probably happened right here at Dumbro in recent years. That's the receiving of the Inca community in sure. this congregation. You know, when it started out, it was, um, they were by themselves. And that was it. It took a number of years before that, that uh, say receiving or that welcoming or that openness between uh, the, the congregations became to, that started to gel together. Yeah, that's, so that's they, a nice they point. Were kind of, they were kind of held off at a distance, if I, 
because I was a part of that right up front, and so I could see that happening. And uh, uh, it, it, it took a while, uh, and I don't mean this in a, to offend anyone, but it took a while from my perspective for Zumbro to be warmed up to this idea of their presence. Yeah, it's a good point. And they're beautiful people, I and mean, they have yeah. terrific faith. Yeah. That's a nice point. I remember making a hospital call shortly after I came here, and we started talking about the Dinkas, and it wasn't in a positive sense. And yeah. this person was convinced they were Muslims. Yeah. And I said, no, they're not. They're Christians. They, But no, this person was convinced they were Muslims, and they didn't belong here. So it, it, it does take time. It does. That's, that's a nice analogy. We, that would be true with other groups, too. I think of people who were deadly disabled when they first came to this church. And there was a message that they don't belong. Yeah, there can be, absolutely. Yeah. Let's press on. We're going to skip number seven. Um, and we'll go on to question B. The last passage we're going to read out loud in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, which sounds like Mark, except Mark didn't have all, quite all that much stuff in the middle, did he? So... Peter's the first disciple to call Jesus the Messiah, at least out loud. What do you think is going through Peter's mind as he does this? What do you think? Let's just talk as a group. Just trying it out. Yeah. Do I dare say it? Do I dare say it? I, I'll try this on for size. What else? What's going through his mind? At this point, I mean, they're just coming from that, but I don't know if they're they're perceiving a big, big push to the Gentiles at this point. I think it, it's pretty much Israel, with a few side excursions, just a few. I wonder if he is thinking that eventually Jesus is going to throw the Romans out. Got to be some of that thinking. Got to be going to throw those Romans out. Going to be a great country again. Absolutely. It has always actually bothered me the part near the end where it says, and I'm giving you <laughs> the, if you lose it on, or you can send people to hell and you can decide they're going up to hell. Yeah. Because these are human beings. Why would you give them that sort of power? Yeah. Hang on to that question, Chris. It's a good one. That's that's coming up in nine and ten. So hang on to that. All the answers will be clear before we're gone. So. Other things? Well, Peter seemed to be the most risk taking one of. He was the one who wanted to get out of the boat. And he's sort he's of He's the one the that's edge. always the first one on the on the chopping block, isn't he? Yeah. He's gonna stick his foot in his mouth if he needs to, but he's gonna say it. He's the kid in class that always speaks up first. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's got to have something to do. We, we talked at the beginning in chapter 1-1, one, one, Jesus, son of, son of David. It's got to have something to do with that, that ideal king, that ideal king that is coming. You know, and the longer you wait for that king, the more you idealize what that king will do and what that king will bring. Uh, whether it's peace or justice or righteousness or fairness or prosperity, it's a whole lot of things, I think. But it deeply rooted in the hopes that they have for their nation and their people. 
So no, I think, Emily, back to you, I don't think it's very much about the Gentiles at this point. I think this is really about the Jews. And the Jews, finally, everything has come to be that we hoped for along the way. So I really think that's going through his mind. And so why doesn't why don't they get to tell anyone? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Waiting for the release time of the resurrection. Yeah. You know, in, in Matt in Mark this is very clear. In, uh, where in Mark they're never supposed to tell anyone. And and, and really it gets it gets built up as a messianic secret. Keep this a secret. And, and there's a theological reason for this. Because you can't understand who Jesus is until the cross. And, and that's Mark's whole point. And so finally, the, the, the centurion, when Jesus dies, says, truly this is the Son of God. So finally it's clear. But it won't be clear until then. So don't think Jesus is just here for all these other things. No, he's really here to die on a cross as Messiah. So I think you've got some of that going here. I think you could say that, you know, it's one thing to get Jesus half right. And I think they've got Jesus half right at this point. He is, he is the Messiah. But I don't think they, they've got him all right. And that all right part is that the Messiah must suffer and die. It's going to be a while before they get that. It's going to be very painful before they get that. And so they're just getting it half right at this point. And so, uh, as a, in, in a theological kind of way, what Matthew want to makes the point, that just like Jesus did to his disciples, you only understand half of it at this point. More is coming. More is coming. Sure. Yep. I think for the first time I, I've heard a different thing. You, Simon, son of Jonah. Yeah, I know. That quick for the first time. That's this yeah. significant new dad. Yeah, yeah. Jonah. Let's go on to question nine. We only have a little time left, and I want to get there. Jesus responds to Peter with the plan words, Your name is Rock, and on this rock I will build my church. The Roman Catholic Church has traditionally... I'm asking this just because of my dad, okay? The Roman Catholic Church has traditionally understood this as a reference to the papacy. Do you think they're right? Or is there something else going on here? What do you think? Let's pick on the Catholics a while. I'm sorry. I Anybody here grow up Catholic? No. All right, we're safe. All right. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But I certainly heard about the Catholics when I was growing up. Whatever you do, don't marry Catholic. And, and on and on and on. My dad would go. On and on and on we go. I never heard that, so I married Catholic. I didn't know that. <laughs> so is this about the papacy? What do you think? Well, that's, they claim that authority. And that's why they're so into the line is... Absolutely clear from here, from Peter all on the down. way back to mm -hmm. the word when Christ named Peter okay. the Rock. Yeah. He's you? done what we've done. Trying to bring up human feeling and structure mm -hmm. so that we can understand. Yeah. And that, you know, we've done that same thing, all of this is just trying to get in so we understand what it really is to us. Yeah. Well, it suggests you only get God's mercy if you get it right and you do all these certain things. Yeah. And um, you do that. Well, people try. You know, as a biblical scholar, and I'm biased, I know I don't come from a Catholic tradition, um, I think this story says a lot more just about Jesus and Peter than it does about the Catholic Church. I mean, I don't have a big problem that they will trace their papacy back to this moment and this time. But, you know, from my perspective, from my humble perspective, it seems a little presumptuous at times. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's about Peter and Jesus, though. And uh, Jesus is pointing to Peter as the leader of the church. He's that foundation stone, that principal leader of the new people of God. And, and he is those things. He is the one. He is the kid that speaks up in class. He is the one that, that is there to lead the charge. Um, he's there to interpret the... Christian movement, he's there in Acts to <coughs> preach the first sermon. He's a, he's a lot of things. And so uh, he is the leader in this church, and Jesus has singled him out for that reason. But yeah, I think it's it's kind of a stretch from my perspective then to say automatically that he's the first pope. Is that, is that okay? Don't tell your Catholic friends. <laughs> <laughs> so 
And, and then I want to go on to the last one. It's Chris. I think that it's uh, more about his profession. If you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God, that is the rock in the church. Okay. <clears throat> the whole Christian church is built upon Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to go on to that last question. We've got about four minutes. Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom of heaven to Peter and the disciples. What does this mean for the life and work of the church? You know, when you, when you stop and really read those things, they can be problematic, can't they, Chris? I hear what you're saying. And I will tell you, you are Peter on the rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Explain it to us, old scholar. <laughs> I was going to talk to the bishop about that. So. <laughs> bishop Nicolo, could you uh, share a word about that? Share a perspective on that. Well, there is more grace in it than, than law for me, mm -hmm. always. Uh, but yet, there is an authority in the church that um, that comes to people with uh, with the preaching of the law, but more importantly, the offer of grace. And so, if it, if there wasn't any authority, where would that where would that leave the church? Yeah, I mean, it's really easy to think of. Well, what about this? bad pastor, or what about this situation, or this person that got excommunicated from a church? It's easy to go there. But but I really think, at, at a more basic level, you could argue that what Matthew wants to say, what Jesus wants to say here, is that what the church does matters to God. You're out taking a stand. You're out working for reconciliation. You're out uh, teaching faith to children. This matters to God more than you could possibly know. Um, so this isn't just about Jesus being the Messiah. This is about his followers uh, doing things in Jesus' name that are going to matter to God. And it goes on and on it, to, to this day. And I think the keys of the kingdom, yes, can be taken as some sort of club, but they're, they're not really meant to be that at all. Um, if, if, if you had to withhold forgiveness, God forbid, uh, and, and have some discipline in the life of the church, God forbid, then you'll have to work that out. But, you know, the, the Bible, the message of the Bible is always about forgiveness and mercy and for a person to be restored to the faith and not to be excommunicated from the faith. So I don't know if that's helpful, but it is a powerful thing to, to stand up on a Sunday morning and to say your sins are forgiven you. Um, that would be an exercise of the office of the keys. Um, I don't say that under my own authority or power. It's, it's Jesus. It's Jesus that makes those promises to you. And uh, I, I certainly wouldn't want to withhold that, or I wouldn't want to be about that work of withholding it, except in the most extreme situations. Is that, is that enough for that? Uh, what you do matters to God. I think that's, that's the way I look at that. And God will not abandon the church in the midst of the work that God is doing in and through the church. But God will work to keep it faithful. Uh, I would disagree with uh, certain portions of this. I think the church does get it wrong sometimes. We do. Uh, we're not inerrant in any possible way. We're, we're going to get it wrong sometimes, but God will not leave us alone. God will keep working in us and through us because it matters. All right. Is that enough for today? Thank you for... All that you brought, we have two things to go, but I uh, appreciate your comments and your work and your ministry. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.